Hello and welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm Michael Jacoby, executive producer of Jazz on the Class here in Los Gatos and the host of Raising the Standards on KSCO Radio in Santa Cruz. Delighted to have you with us uh, for this session and a session with good words. We've got a doc who's the chief medical officer of O'Connor Hospital, Dr. Arthur Woodrow, which is a hip middle name. Very unusual, Arthur. Oh, Art, yes. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Oh, no, that's DeVille. DeVille. Nah, that's the less expensive Cadillac. Is it? <laughs> that's, that's the one. The, the coupe. The coupe, <laughs> yes. Anyway, delighted to have you here. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you as, as you being uh, the representative of the Film Club Congress for sponsoring the show. Fantastic. Thanks a lot to us. And of course, you're part of Verity Health. Um, you are the, uh, first of all, you're a Jayhawk. Oh, yes. Right. University of Kansas, yeah. Jayhawk, Rock Chalk, yeah. that now, sort of thing. Were you there with Gail Sayre? Yes, towards the end of that See? reign, yes. The same general yes. vintage, plus or minus yeah. a little. Now, did you grow up in Kansas? I did. I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, kind of in the Overland Park Prairie Village. Okay. Uh, very much an East Coast city, though, and suburban. So you... Were the Monarchs still playing? I playing? can't recall that they were. Monarchs was a Negro baseball league. I didn't know that yeah. they were there, anyway, to be honest. As a matter of fact, uh, the museum, if you're the next time you're back, which is remarkable. The it? Nelson Art Gallery is fantastic. Yeah. World-class museum. It is. It is a, a great barbecue, obviously. A great town. Gates Barbecue. Bill Clinton visited. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so you grew up... What part of Kansas? Uh, it's actually uh, just a very far eastern part of the, the suburban area. It's suburban. called Prairie Village, Overland Park, that area. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Um, very much a suburban guy, you know, suburban growing and I. Yeah. Kind of a strip mall guy. Well, no, not so much that. We had some great malls, the Hallmark Mall yeah. and the Plaza area. So we grew up with some great uh, venues there. And then I was a student at the University of Kansas, uh, which is at the uh, Medical Center in Kansas City. And again, an organization that, grow, that has grown tremendously over the years. Well, talking about dating ourselves, you come, as I do, from the, the uh, Marcus Welby era. Mm, yeah. But was there an epiphany at some point as a, as a young man? I was interested in medicine from the time I was in the sixth grade, actually. Yeah. Yes. I remember uh, I was on school patrol reading about Hansen's disease, which is uh, leprosy, actually. Yeah. I remember someone asked me, what the devil yeah. is that all about? So it dates, back, dates back that far. I read a book, uh, Not as a Stranger, which yeah. tells about the travails of the young medical student and how he evolved into a young physician. Uh, plumbing the mysteries of the human yeah, heart and right. soul through the medical world. Yeah, so uh, I had very much that kind of spirit of medicine in mind. Was the, as you say, that you, you have a fascination and, and uh, perhaps, as we mentioned, Marcus Bubbly, but perhaps, but I'd like to work with people, I'd like to help people, I'd like to take it. Today, it's, it's uh, not the doctors don't have still have good bedside manner, mm -hmm. but it's it's kind of a different approach today. Is it uh, well, more done, of a high yeah. tech? Well, high tech was always part of it. I mean, one thing that brings uh, young men and women to medicine is not just the human side, really, but they're, they're very interested in technology and science. They're early adopters frequently of technology. So 85, 90% of doctors have uh, smartphones, for example, and teaching them how to use it. It's another matter sometimes. But uh, so I think it's the, it's the uh, science as well as the human understanding, scientific excellence as well as human understanding understanding that drives young young physicians still today. And believe me, as a medical uh, chief medical officer of a hospital, it's still herding cats. They have very independent ideas about how they want to approach things, but they're more attuned these days to cost issues, for example, efficiency of care. But we, uh, we work very hard to make sure they work in an environment where they can still express the human understanding side. Is the chief medical officer more prone to say that than us? 
Well, when you say them, yeah. yes, but I want you to know I did a, I did a, I'm still in the practice of medicine, by the way, and I did a practice in, in, Mountain. in Mountain View still, although I'm planning to move it to the South Bay now, and I did a house call as recently as two weeks ago. Did you really? I do. I do house calls, uh, particularly for um, patients with multiple sclerosis or severe strokes or other disease processes that make it impossible well, for them to... Stroke. Yeah, but has the compassion kept up with the technology? And, and, and the reason I say mm -hmm. that is because I remember growing, growing up and going to see uh, mm -hmm. TV and uh, spending time. And sure. Now I, 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 I go, and I know it's the nature of the business. But now, you know, if I get six or seven minutes, it's, it's remarkable. Well, I think primary care physicians are under tremendous pressure. Yeah. For one thing, uh, reimbursements have fallen against costs, and that puts tremendous pressure on them to be efficient in the office setting, for example. And in the hospital, the caseloads are frequently fairly high for them. So I think those are the things that make them want to be efficient and seem to be efficient. And as you're already discovering, the, the average time for a patient to talk is 90 seconds before the doctor interrupts them. You know, it's kind of tough. But we're seeking information. And I want you to know that the idea of compassion in medicine is very much alive. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about what we call HCAPS, which uh, I won't go into the acronym if I can remember it even properly, but it has to do with the idea that patients who are in the hospital need to be happy and satisfied with the kind of human care that they got. Is it noisy? Is it clean? Did the nurse explain things to me? Did the doctor talk to me? Um, were my meals hot? <laughs> you know? I think those things we're really interested in in the hospital setting and doctors want to participate. Well, and, and this will be my first big digress, but uh, I've been part of the hospitality business, uh, the restaurants for years. And Danny Myers from New York, who started Shake Shack, uh -huh. uh, the key of acronyms, has H2, which is your hospitality quotient, uh -huh. which is essentially what you're talking about. We are. So you have to have this. Uh, and and, and yeah, we all get busy and, uh, take it for granted. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't mean by any stretch of imagination saying there's a lack of compassion. But maybe it's not practice as much because of time. Well, there's a, it takes yeah. a special talent to do it in a shorter amount of time. You know, you have to get down to the patient's level. When you visit the bedside, you, you get down to the bed, you sit down. You're not hovering oh, over them, you know. Like and you well. you lean forward a little bit and you, you know, yes. you know how, are you, how are you feeling yeah. today? How are things going in the hospital for you? So uh, our leadership makes rounds like that every day in the which, hospital. Which is great. great. And the doctors do it too. My doctor said to me, I'm going to give you a flu shot. And I said, flu shots are for old people. And he said, yes. No, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the young people that die from the That's, flu. Yeah. It's kind of, it's when your immune system is a little less competent, you're, you're going to survive the flu. When your immune system's hyperactive and you get the flu and your lungs fill up because the, all the, the white cells are fighting the bacteria and drawing fluid in, that's, I won't bore you with all well, that. No, but no, no, that's right. I, yeah. I want to talk about being a chief medical officer uh, and, and, and keeping your own practice. Is, mm -hmm. is that, is it somewhere between administrating mm -hmm. and, uh, and hands on is it, is it difficult uh -huh. to balance it too? It's not. It's not easy. I'll, I'll admit. It's very. It takes a lot of time. I spend a lot of hours every week on a very small residual practice. Uh, but you know. Um, as we worked through the whole administrative process, the uh, leadership at my hospital thought it was important to remain involved with patients in a direct kind of way. Is, is it something akin to uh, if you're a painter still painting once in a while? Is it is well? It good for your, yeah. is there, it's good for your spirit to know I'm doing this too. Absolutely, you know I get a lot of uh, joy from seeing my patients. Yeah. Still, what? Um, Give me a patient story from when you when you were starting first starting out that wow. you're particularly proud of or mm. you moved by. Well, it's a tough, you know, I uh, immediately get back to a patient with a disease called myasthenia. Okay. And it's, a, it's an illness where you can start to be unable to breathe and clear secretions, hard to open your eyes. You can be in the intensive care unit for some time. And I remember vividly just making sure that I visited that patient every day at the same time. 
so that no matter what happened in the environment, she knew that I was going to be there at the same time every day. And that's the kind of thing that I kind of remember. Talking to Dr. Arthur Duville, Chief Medical Officer of O'Connor Hospital, which coincidentally are the good folks uh, that sponsor this show, a part of the Verity Health. We're going to take a quick uh, break and uh, have a word from them, and we'll be back with the doc. This is Talk of the Town. At O'Connor Hospital, we're restoring health together, step by step, together, because care is better together. O'Connor, together in health. At O'Connor Hospital, we're shortening your wait time, because in an emergency, every minute counts. This is our commitment to you. O'Connor Hospital, together in health. And welcome back to Talk of the Town. Mike and Jacoby with you as we continue our conversation with Dr. Arthur Duville, Chief Medical Officer of O'Connor Hospital, part of Verity Health. Uh, we mentioned, what you, could you have that hit middle name, Woodrow? Where's that come from? It's unusual. My uh, father's not a big name in the book. No, well, Woody might be, I guess. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, my, uh, my, I'm a junior, so Arthur Woodrow Duville was my dad. And, and no, I have no son. I have a daughter. She's self-supporting thing. Okay. So, uh, so my great, my grandfather was a Democratic politician in Wisconsin, and he was an admirer of Woodrow Wilson. That's where the name comes okay. from. Although, just to balance the, the situation, my my father was a Republican legislator in Kansas. So we we got both ends. So. Well, I watched this thing. So speaking of Woodrow Wilson, who had a stroke later in his career. He did. <laughs> I can't believe I made that move. You have uh, worked uh, on developing stroke programs. I have, yeah. I have always heard uh, that if you have a stroke and you, and you go to an emergency, the first thing you should say is, I have an incredible headache and I don't have headaches. Mm. Uh, it's better to say I'm worried that I might be having a stroke. That'll get, that'll get them going. It takes off one level of guessing. It, it does, uh, yeah. Most headaches are not due to, although headache is a common uh, phenomenon in stroke as a precursor, it's uh, not a very common uh, presentation. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, the classics, uh, facial drooping, uh, weakness or numbness in extremity, trouble walking. But, but think, uh, the, look up fast and Google these days and you'll get kind of the list. But time is crucial, too. Yeah. Get thee to a hospital, ASAP, one the fastest way possible. Now, 30 years ago, it was a fail complete. I mean, it, it, it was rare that, that anybody was, was treated for a stroke. They were just treated for the effects of the stroke. That's exactly and right. now, as you say... Get there and get there right away. Well, we have, uh, we have, we'd like to treat patients within 45 minutes. That's our goal. And we have drugs now that will break up blood clots. They need to be given within three to four hours. But nowadays, we have new technologies where we can actually go inside the brain with a tiny catheter and remove a clot right from the artery in the brain. That fancy name for that's thrombectomy. But does that have to be done? Immediately. Sooner the better, within 90 minutes ideally, uh, if not faster. However, we can now treat patients up to 24 hours uh, in selected cases. We, we know now how better to select patients for those kinds of advanced technologies. If I had a stroke, what would be a good hospital I should go to? It depends on where you live. You want to go to a facility that has a, at least a primary stroke center. Uh, that means that they have a CT scanner available. That's the first test. And that they can distinguish you as a patient who needs an advanced technology versus basic treatment with TPA, which is the clot-busting drug. Uh, in our area, uh, Good Samaritan Hospital is a great stroke program. O'Connor is a primary stroke center. Regional Medical Center in Stanford. What's the primary stroke center? The primary means that they've got the 24 hours, uh, seven days a week CT scans, a neurologist on call who can evaluate the stroke based on CAT scan and clinical presentation and give basic treatment, which is TPA in selected cases. Comprehensive centers are uh, more able to treat with advanced technologies like the thrombectomy. 
at O'Connor, we're becoming a thrombectomy-ready stroke center, which means that we can so treat virtually yeah, everything. Be, That's the ideal, yeah. 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 I, I've often wondered about, I mean, when I went to college, I had to choose a major, but I've often wondered, it says, okay, you get into medical school, all the stress, all the pressure. At some point, you go, what are we going to do? I mean, what brought you to neurology? Well, I was always fascinated with uh, behavior. You know, why do people do the things that they do? And uh, it turns out the brain is the organ of behavior. So if you're interested in psychiatry and why the brain does the things that it does to make us do what we do, that's a start. And then I was always fascinated with the uh, computational aspects of the brain, if you like, the science of the brain, how we move and how we feel and how we see the world, for example. So the, the patients you still carry in mind, uh -huh. Primarily, what, what kind of patients? They're general neurology patients. I have patients with MS, Parkinson's disease, some stroke patients, what, uh, migraine. <laughs> what of, of the illnesses like MS mm -hmm. uh, 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 the, the different neurological uh, uh, diseases? What's making the most progress? Well, one wonderful things about neurology these days. So when I was in training initially, the only drug we had for multiple sclerosis was a compound called ACTH, which, which causes your body when injected to make cortisone-like uh, uh, hormones in the body. Now we have 15 drugs for MS. We hardly know what which one to pick anymore. Uh, we have so many options and so many opportunities. So we talked about stroke, for example. Uh, when I was in training in medical school, Parkinson treatment was in its infancy. Now we have a dozen drugs for Parkinson's disease. So there's been tremendous scientific uh, uh, progress in neurology, which has been really exciting to see. It's, um, it, it's so odd and ironic that sometimes uh, out of tragedy can come good things. For yeah. instance, with all the, the brain traumas during the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've advanced so far in treatment. Well, uh, we're talking about post-concussion syndrome, which we mostly have seen in auto accidents, and now there's a whole wave of these things coming through from these uh, wars in the Middle East, and also now uh, athletes, post-concussion encephalopathy, it's called, or post-traumatic PTE, post-traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, we're becoming more and more aware of the sports aspect of uh, brain injury. You... Uh you're a, you keep yourself pretty active. Very. You ski? You, you, no, I, I stopped skiing. I got this in your resume. I, I, I need to correct that. Former skier, I, not that I've become, was injured or anything, but I wanted to avoid it. So, you do, you still so uh, I never have injured myself, but I saw, but I saw, I get up every morning at five o'clock. I don't need to break that, so when I get up, I look like it. Five o'clock, I'm up. By 5.30, I'm in the gym at a local center here, that I won't advertise for here, but well known. And... Um, and so by 6.30, I'm done with my elliptical and weightlifting and stuff and go on with my day. So I'm, I'm more of an organized exercise. You live in I do, yeah. Good cook? My wife is a great cook. Are you a good cook? Uh, no, not anymore. I'm afraid not. Maybe more. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have time. Don't have I've time. got to admit. I don't. How many, and we just got a couple of minutes left, yeah. how many... Um, how many doctors are you over? Because I know St. Louis is part of the group, too. Yes, it is, sir. Are, are, you, you, are you over all of them? Well, over is a tough How word. Cats do you yeah. How many cats do I hear? <laughs> About 900. Whoa. Lord. Yeah, roughly speaking. Six, seven hundred. You know, uh, my, the doctors at my facilities are uh, their servants. They really are. The ideal of service at O'Connor Hospital and at St. Louis are unmatched anywhere in the region. And most of them don't drive really fancy cars, yeah. by the way. Well, O'Connor has such a, a marvelous reputation and such a great history. Uh, it does. Uh, yeah. Being run, uh, originally was run by which order? Well, uh, the Daughters of Charity are the most well-recognized. But, you know, that facility was uh, started as a philanthropic uh, hospital by Amanda O'Connor in 1889. 
and the whole Verity system is a series of, uh, of about six hospitals that were under the daughters and that were founded as philanthropic organizations. What is, um, give me the, 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 the privacy that, that uh, you are, that you, you feel about it. Uh, that ideal, that ideal of service yeah. that, uh, I mean, it's, it's capital. Absolutely. It still lives on, and that's why I'm there, frankly. Uh, the hospital went through some serious financial issues, and uh, but uh, currently the managing directors of the hospital have a philanthropic goal in mind of making the hospital efficient enough to make its way. And we broke even this year, by the way, uh, in December, and for the first time in many years. Uh, so the hospitals will become efficient. They will become uh, self-supporting. But uh, there's a philanthropic organization behind the hospitals that will rebuild them. And so that's what's so exciting about what I'm doing. Well, uh, we're we here are delighted that we can help spread the word. But great. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. It's great it's meeting you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> you lead in. I do. I lead in. <laughs> I, I learned that from somewhere. <laughs> Dr. Arthur Duville from O'Connor Hospital. Thank thanks you. Thanks to the good folks at O'Connor Department of Fairly Health. Uh, next week, let's get together again. Until next time, I'm Jacoby. I'll see you soon.